trying to get back to the basics of great products. Power comes from sharing information. I try to convince people to slow down. Free. Yeah. Open. This is the Soak Tyson Podcast. Hello, hello, welcome back to the Soaked by Slush podcast. My name is William von der Palen and next to me is Isaac Rautio. Hi, William. And uh, today's guest is uh, the CEO, CEO and co-founder of Sender, uh, David Nothacker. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Very, very glad you could could join the show. Do um, you want to start off by telling the listeners who you are? Sure. I'm, as you mentioned, the CEO and founder of Sender. It's a digital freight forwarder to my grandmother. I always explain it as an Uber for trucks. Um, uh, so it's very straightforward. We have big customers on one side. They're called AB InBev uh, or Unilever uh, that have to move freight from point A to point B and need a truck. And on the other side, we have small family-owned trucking companies that have no digital processes. And we bring the two sides together, um, uh, not only as a marketplace, step further with a contractual partner and a single point of contact to both the AB InBevs and the small trucking company. Yeah, exactly. I think it's a very needed idea for anyone who's been dealing with shipping before, as we discussed before the uh, episode. We also noted that you worked in consulting before uh, becoming an entrepreneur, and there's quite a few successful startup founders who's who've kind of uh, gone through the consulting path before uh, founding a company. So where do you see the synergies between consulting and entrepreneurship why it's a good match well back then when when i started my professional career consulting was still a cool thing to do after investment banking yeah. i think uh, uh, the priorities of, uh, of of students these days change but for me it was a great school back then i always like to think about it that in university i learned to think and that in consulting i learned to work to apply the theoretical thinking Um, to, to the real life and that's why it was a good excellent school to get structure processes to know how to communicate how to interact with also senior stakeholders how to manage a team but a lot of trainings a lot of exposure so uh, definitely at least for me it was hard it was not always fun i can tell you that uh, but it was definitely a good school do you think it it has you know is it important that it be consulting or could you could it just as well just be that you found a few companies you learn those things and then you're maybe more ready to do something on a bigger scale is it is the the big thing you get out of it is is you know learning how to work as you said there are different ways to success and consulting is just one yeah. of really many um uh, i think these days just Starting something, learning on the fly, sometimes takes longer, sometimes, and, you know, there are also mistakes, which any way you do. Anytime you start a company, it's also another very successful way of doing. I think back then, at least for me, startups was something I was not really familiar with, so it was a bit distant. Uh, so for me, the more natural and probably also lower risk step was into consulting, and then more by chance that I that I, that I got to 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 the startup life. Do you want to talk about that chance or that jump? Uh, was it something that you discovered in while you were working in consulting that this is something that needs to be uh, fixed or changed or in- innovated on? It was actually a university project because after a couple of years of consulting, I went back to to to, to university to to do an MBA, and in my first semester, I was put together into a group. Um, uh, and was really to get to know each other and we had to do an exercise and it was for the founder of Blablaka, also a ride-sharing company, also a big unicorn in Europe. And out of that project, uh, that was really just set to get to know each other. An idea came out, took it throughout the entire MBA, did all the entrepreneurship classes, venture competition, and really thought I had the perfect business model, business plan, everything. Then after graduating, I decided to move to uh, Berlin um, with an MBA co-founder. Uh, it took us one year to realize that what we have prepared or had prepared during the MBA was actually not really working. We didn't have a single customer. And then I went through a tricky phase, almost faced bankruptcy, um, but was very, very lucky. Found an angel investor, found two new co-founders. And then beginning 2017, I started Sender 2.0 was still the same company. I had injured investors, friends, family, um, and uh, classmates, and also some professors and investors. So I took the same entity and then pivoted 
into the business model, the Uber for trucking that I that I shared with you earlier. Do you want to talk about that pivot a bit more? What was that like, and how 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 do you go through a pivot that hard? First, from going near bankruptcy to where you are now. The way I experience it is not something I would recommend to anyone. No, <laughs> because the, I didn't do my homework properly. I always base, let's say, my action um, on assumption that I did not test this product market fit. Going out and testing things and changing and moving is something that I didn't do, uh, and I didn't do it the first time, uh, and it didn't work. And the second time, I just kept going. And we went to two big e-commerce companies one day, uh, one with a big A and one with a big Z. And, uh, um, and we were pitching our first business model, the old one, which was around same-day parcel delivery. And we saw them always a little bit as a competition. Same-day parcel delivery was coming and the big e-commerce were offering it. And we had a business model addressing smaller e-commerce, offering also a fast delivery by using buses for the long distance the last night. Um, uh, back then, I really thought it was the next big thing. And, uh, but then when pitching to them, uh, we realized that they were not interested in what we were offering, but saw in our presentation that we also have small vans in our, let's say, plan, because we thought when the bus, the belly of the bus is full with parcels, it makes sense to get a small van for the long distance part. And they asked us, do you have, can you do this? And of course, we said yes, even though we didn't really have a lot of experience in that. And that's how we jumped into that freight forwarding brokerage business. And then as we kept going and growing, we really realized what the opportunity really was and how big it could have uh, become. And which just by chance, we were extremely lucky. For a second time, I didn't do my homework properly. I just followed the only opportunity I had to keep the company alive that then luckily turned into uh, what Senna is today. But as mentioned, I would not recommend anyone to go their same path, do your homework, test whether there is someone that really wants your product and also or, or service and try to understand how big it can get. We go all in, and that's something that I was very lucky. But uh, if I would speak to myself of five years ago, I would probably tell myself, you know, stop it, take a, take a step back, maybe go back into consulting um, for one or two years, and then start again at the later stage. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, it's not exactly a new industry, the freight forwarding industry. So, why do you think the timing is ripe right now, and and why do you think digitalization is is happening at the, the pace it's happening right now? I think if you follow the news, um, especially if you see what happened, what is happening in, in the UK, McDonald's is running out of matrix, fuel stations out of fuel and supermarkets out of goods to sell. And um, this just shows that supply chains are broken. The way they work today are not any longer um, feasible at scale. And I think what we see in the UK is definitely driven by Corona and by uh, Brexit, but it's tipped off the iceberg. Same structural problems that we see in the UK have been accelerated by again Brexit and and, and Corona. Um, we also have in continental Europe. We have them in Finland as well. There's a structural problem, which is the, uh, there's not enough truck drivers in the market. Just one of many. This is why um, uh, coming back to your question, logistics is yes an old school industry that has seen very little innovation over the past 20 to 30 years. Um, and now because we have structural problems and increased demand for always faster and more flexible supply chain solution and deliveries, it is, in my opinion, in the spotlight. And the one thing that excites me about the future, not only of stand of this industry, is that I really believe that in the next 10 years, we're going to see a lot of innovation coming that will fundamentally change the way this industry works. It's not going to be my kids or grandkids, which I don't have yet, um, uh, but it's going to be Senda and myself that will witness it for sure, but put, also have the potential to influence and impact uh, and change the way this industry is evolving. And this is why I'm really excited about what we have ahead of us. In what ways did you uh, identify that the ch- uh, supply chains were broken? What were the main things that just didn't work. You mentioned the lack of drivers. That's obviously a big one. Well, I can just give you a few numbers and then you feel like how, how, how inefficient and broken this is. We started with drivers. In continental Europe, 
Today, we're missing over 500,000 truck drivers. We could employ tomorrow 500,000 more truck drivers. It is crazy. The market is super fragmented. That shows the inefficiency. 70% of all trucks that you see on the road are owned by companies that have fewer than 10 trucks. Really, really small companies that don't work in a digital way. They use phones, WhatsApp, sometimes even still fax machine to, to have orders formalized and sent over. It's really, really old school. 25% of all trucks are drive completely empty because of information asymmetry. If there is a truck that drives some load from, I don't know, Helsinki to Berlin, that same truck probably struggles to find a back load back to Helsinki and has to drive to the Denmark, uh, um, uh, where then he knows someone that has a load that, that brings him back home. Because of information asymmetry, also something that with technology um, uh, we, we can solve. So there's a number of indicators that just show this is a huge industry, 350 billion in size, Europe road freight. So I'm not talking about air, sea, air freight, sea freight. Just what is moved on the road in Europe is 350 billion in size, which is huge. And if you look at that market, oh, that's industry, there's a lot of things that are broken and the numbers that I shared with you, just the tip of the iceberg. I would not be surprised if maybe also Hasburger uh, in, uh, is running out of fries and uh, we don't have any longer French butter in German supermarkets. Yeah, no, it's it's for sure becoming an, an increasing problem at the moment. Um, there's a lot of talk about where, when we look at the most valuable companies in the world right now, they are almost all of them are B2C platform companies. They are based on on not owning a product per se. Maybe they are they're connecting people with with or or giving having people give up their data or something like that. Um, if you then look at the B2B platform side, there seems to be a huge amount of potential, but there are not that many companies yet that are these huge, huge B2B platform companies. Uh, but th- it seems that, that that would be the the next big thing in terms of this business model. So um, how much do you, okay, you haven't built a B2C platform company, so this is always a hard question, but do you think, do you see, what is the main difference? Because, uh, you know, just on the, off the top of my head, if you build a B2C platform, you need to sign up individual users quite a lot. If you build a B2B platform, it's more about getting maybe the forwarders to sign up and then having a different kind of customers. It seems like the sales and, and user acquisition pro- uh, processes at least are completely different from a B2C platform company. So do you see there's a different way to approach building a company like this? Uh, it's a very good point. I think if you look at how digitalization impacted industry, definitely started with B2C. And it always comes in waves. They're always, you know, a cohort of companies that are doing exactly the same and they all come more or less at the same time, a few survive and then so on. So it started, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago and was mostly B2C, it started with e-commerce and then um, went to a lot of other uh, space, space in the B2C segment. I think B2B picked up already five, maybe already 10 years ago, um, but it's not as much in the spotlight as B2C, because B2C is something that you see every day as a consumer and you realize it's out there. Um, while B2B, sometimes even bigger, uh, is, is not in, 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 let's say, present in your, in your daily life. That's why you're not aware maybe of companies such as uh, Sender, but you maybe know more companies such as Uber or Flixbus um, where, where, where you have an interaction. And on your question, is there a different way of approaching it? Yes, for sure. Um, there's also different business models within B2B, some that are a bit closer to B2C, where marketing plays a big role, others that are closer to more key account management, where you have to identify the key decision makers that can unlock a huge opportunity within big companies. But what I think is a common denominator is that businesses are more reluctant to try something new um, and adopt new technologies. And this is why I think also We saw first in the B2C segment, a lot of innovation. Consumers try out, they're more flexible. Um, And now as the pressure is coming, the digitalization pressure is coming also to the B2B segment, I think uh, we're going to see much more over the next couple of years in industries that we don't know about, but are huge. Yeah. Exactly. How did you approach the the carriers? How because you need you need customers obviously to, to get off the ground and and create the value. So, how did you go about finding the first major accounts to manage in the first place? 
So our business model is also backed by a marketplace model. So we had a couple of big e-commerce that gave us a, an opportunity, extremely lucky. So we had constant volume coming in and could build a carrier base uh, that we then could use to approach other customers and then you know build up um, our, our our marketplace model in, in the background. But I mentioned earlier, trucking companies, truck drivers, carriers is something that we're struggling to find. Everyone is competing for the same truck. There are multiple loads. In Germany, there are up to three loads for the same truck. And the truck owner can decide, hey, do I go for Senda or do I go for Dibyshenka, Kunanagel, or maybe other uh, that are out there. And that's why we had to tailor our value proposition to our carriers. It's definitely superior. just want to mention one point, which is accelerated payment and invoice stack. We pay our invoices to carriers within three days um, from, from the load uh, being executed. And this is so powerful that we started offering now also invoice factoring solutions where the small carriers can upload invoices that they send to our competitors to third parties and also get the money within three days instead of waiting 45 to 60 days, which is the industry average. This is how we so say hook them, convince them, hey, yes, your phone is ringing all the time, but do it with Sender. You get faster payment. And the second step, you can generate the invoices directly on our system for free. Do the entire planning on our platform also for free. Then you, you get them on our platform and then you switch the capacity, which we then can use with return to grow uh, or fuel our growth on, on, on the ship. Yeah. What about uh, uh, the the other side of it, the bigger companies? You mentioned Unilever. Uh, how is that type of uh, acquisition? It must differ a lot from contacting and trying to acquire smaller trucking companies. Absolutely. Uh, so on, on the big enterprise side, shipper side, it's always a couple of key decision makers that you have to commit. And it takes time. Sales cycles are extremely long. It can take up to 12 months to materialize. And especially in logistics, it's a, still a very relationship-driven business. So the providers that work with companies such as Unilever or AB InBev have been working with them probably for 20 years already. So when you come in, uh, um, you get first a left up. You have to prove yourself. Luckily, now we get in much more easily because everyone needs trucks. Everyone is struggling to find capacity. And if we come and say, hey, guys, we have trucks because we can source them in a more competitive slash digital way, um, they at least speak to us let us in and say, okay, Christmas is coming up. We're missing trucks. If you say you can do it, be my guest. And then we get the leftovers, the things that no one else wants to do or can do. And then it takes months to build a relationship, to prove yourself. And then ideally when the next tender season comes, these big companies have tenders that where they have regular allocation for one, two or three years. This is then when we then finally have an opportunity to get the ferries that are sizable, that then um, are good to bring a significant volume um, on our part. One thing that's pretty central also to your offering or something that you could potentially be a big part of solving is, as you mentioned, uh, reducing the amount of empty trucks driving on the road and, and thus also creating more sustainable practices in the fr- industry as a whole. Uh, do you want to talk a bit more on, on how you... Uh, how you view the sustainability, how you unlock the sustainability, and, and yeah. if you have some kind of inbuilt cr- criteria, and, and what do you see a platform's role in this, uh, the kind of questions to be in the first place? Absolutely. We see green transport as a really big opportunity for us and also to build a competitive advantage. However, only this year we saw that the first shippers, the AB InBev, for example, were open to the idea to invest and maybe potentially pay also a little bit more to have green transport. And our role as a digital freight order um, is twofold. On one side, we're able to combine loads of different customers in a more efficient way so that we reduce the empty kilometers. In my early example, we have someone coming from Helsinki to Berlin, potentially have someone else then from that, that drives, has a load from Berlin to, I don't know, Denmark, uh, and then follow on load back to Helsinki to reduce this 25% of that kilometers, empty kilometers. And the second one that I find even as exciting, the first one is, there's a lot of new technologies coming on the market. Now we have advanced fuels. 
we have electrification coming uh, um, as, as a next uh, opportunity. But all these new technologies, especially engine technologies, come with a lot of risk. If I have 10 trucks and I have to buy an electrical truck that costs 50% more, but I don't know what my operating costs are, what the residual cost value is and how much business to get, I'm going to stay away from that. But with Sender, we can de-risk that. We can give certain guarantees. We can help financially upfront to say, hey, 50% more. We, as they put it on the table, and you pay us back by driving for us 20% of the time. Um, and so you or 50% if you'd like to. So you reduce the, the risk for you um, to try to uh, adopt these new um, uh, technologies. So our role is not only about being more efficient, and combining loads, reduce that to meet us, but also to be the enabler to adopt new technologies. Electrical trucks is the next big thing. Today, we are with advanced fuels. For example, we have a fuel type that we use that's called HVO, which put very simply is frying oil from McDonald's that has a second life. And that can be used as a fuel and that reduces CO2 emissions by up to 80%. And this is what we're doing today, but also here it's a de-risking uh, and tech adoption, uh, let's say, a factor that we bring to the carriers. And this will become even more important as first electrical trucks are going to go on the road. Actually, next week, we're going to have our first electrical transport uh, um, going uh, going on the road. So quite excited. Very cool. Yeah, yeah, it seems there's a lot of innovation happening. Also, I saw the, what it, was it, the Swedish firm now that uh, sold some um, some big contract to the States where they have unmanned trucks, trucks coming. So I was gonna ask. Yeah, I what was seemed, gonna ask, yeah. seemed like to be, <laughs> you know, it seemed like that was quite far far or it seems like that that's not going to happen for a few years but maybe it's mm -hmm. happening now like pretty quickly at at, at least uh, according to this example so it's very interesting to see how that's going to change yeah how do you think about that yeah this is one of the things that excites me the most i'm okay. very glad you asked the question so um, in my opinion i think that in the next seven to ten years we're going to see the first autonomous trucks but on highways, from highway entry to highway exit, we're going to have big parking lots where traditional trucks and truck drivers will do the last mile from warehouse to uh, um, exit and, and, and back um, for the next 20, 30 years. But I think that in terms of technology, we are almost there, especially if you put a separate dedicated lane on a highway where you don't have any kids playing around. It's really like this long distance uh, trucking that can be uh, come autonomous um, uh, very, very quickly. Now, two more considerations. First is when it will happen, or what does it take to make it happen next seven to 10 years? And secondly, what are the implications for the industry? If you start with the first point, I think it's not about technology readiness that will impact the uh, adoption of this technology, of the autonomous technology, but it will be policy makers. It will be politicians that will have to invest in infrastructure and support the adoption of this technology that, again, in my opinion, is there, is almost there. And if I see what happened now in the UK, if I see what we're experiencing in Europe, we now slowly feeling the shortage of truck drivers. Um, I can imagine that in the next five to ten years, policy makers will realize that instead of losing votes of truck drivers that say I don't vote for you any longer because you're killing my job. They win votes because suddenly truck drivers that are is an aging population in Germany 51 years on average, who third will return the next 12 years, they can sleep at home. Today they sleep three weeks in their truck and they can sleep at home, do the last mile, and the technology companies will also be supportive of these policymakers because new technologies can be adopted. So I think that this is, let's say, what is going to happen in the next seven to, to ten years. Now, the more interesting thing is what is the impact on, 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 on the logistics industry? If you take the more long-term horizon, in 30 to 40 years, a truck can drive autonomous from warehouse to warehouse. And this means that a lot of players, such as truck manufacturers, have to reinvent the business model. If you take one of our investors, which is Scania, uh, Swedish truck manufacturer, today they sell 80 to 80 percent uh, or less of trucks to small companies that have fewer than 100 trucks. And these small companies will eventually lose their purpose, the reason to exist. Again, it's 40 years time policy maker will make sure that they won't disappear from one day to another. 
that we do special transports and a lot of other things in, in the meantime. But they lose the reason to exist because they won't be able to buy a truck. An autonomous truck will not be owned by a small company. If they, something happens, definitely not a company that is responsible for that. They don't have to hire and manage a driver. And they won't be able to optimize costs because they won't be able to change the oil at the neighbor shop and that it's a high-tech machine, it's electrical machine most likely. So they will be phasing out eventually, 30, 40 years from, from now. And that's why play, players in Scania are not going to be selling their trucks to the customer base they have today. They have to reinvent the business model. The customers they're serving today won't be there in 40 years uh, from today. And this is why I think there's not only 70 or 80 percent of the market of this 350 billion market that will be taken on by someone else again step by step but also the big players have to reinvent their business model will it be just asset manufacturer will it put autonomous technology on it will they sell it as a service one kilometer per uh, one euro per kilometer to send up or will it become a logistic provider i think no one has answered these questions but these technology autonomous and a few others as well, will push a, a fundamental transformation into this industry. And as mentioned earlier, we at Send are preparing to be in pole position to make the best out of uh, this transition. I'm also really worried what's going to happen to country music. No one's going to want to listen to songs <laughs> about truckers who get to sleep at home and only drive the last mile. They'll have to reinvent <laughs> country music as well. Yeah. <laughs> but then again, I don't care about country music that much at all. So maybe that's a better future anyway. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Hey, let's talk a bit about um, acquisitions and and also you know growing through acquisitions. Um, so Baslash did a did a uh, survey together with Axel, and uh, in that survey, it seemed that European founders at least prefer taking their companies public um, as opposed to maybe selling the companies onwards. But then, the, if you look at the statistics, it's much more likely that you sell your company than you go public with it. Only a handful of companies end up uh, going public. Um, yeah, you've you've uh, basically seen seen the at least one side of this equation where you've acquired a few few businesses uh, yourself. Uh, you acquired uh, Uber's Freight European business and, and Everroad as well. But uh, and I don't know if you can comment this, but if you can comment on this, do you have have you had um, um, you know other companies trying to acquire you during this this uh, relatively short path of yours already? Interest has been there. Um, but we did not consider it in a, in a seriously for the simple reason is that we're still very bullish. And I realized that what we have with Sender is at least for me a once in a lifetime opportunity. Just after graduating from my MBA, I always thought if someone comes along, pays the right price, you know, I sell it and then do my next thing. Over the past, especially two years, I realized that the likelihood of me building again something like Santa is almost zero. Yeah, so I want to enjoy the ride as, much, as long as I can. I also know that we can take this company up. And this is why, for the time being, we uh, we, we paused any discussion um, um, uh, on that front. And are getting in shape it takes a couple of years uh, to, to be ready to, to go public. And then you have to show a lot of sides of yourself. So you, you better uh, in shape and look good. Exactly. What about your own acquisitions? Have there have have they been um, the companies approaching you, or or do you actively look for for companies to acquire and approach them, or is it you know can it be yeah. both? So our acquisition strategy can be divided into two. First phase was digital phase, and this was more opportunistic. We did not plan that. So we first uh, merged, let's acquired a French company called Everroad. They were our largest competitor in Europe. They were based in France, where we were trying to build our own operations. They were fundraising and Corona hit, and we had an opportunity to do something very uh, interesting for us in France. And this is how that came along. It was more opportunistic. I had a very good relationship with the uh, uh, founder, Maxime, and we kept in contact. And then when the opportunity came, we said, hey, let's do this. And then while we were sitting at the notary, Germany is long for us to fix up. Um, Uber Freight reached out and said, hey, guys, could we talk about the collaboration? And we thought, okay, that sounds interesting. And then after the first discussion with them, we realized, okay, there's an opportunity for us to acquire Uber Freight's European business. And this is what we then did. 
consolidated the European road trade market in the digital space, you now significantly bigger than the two, three other players that um, uh, are competing with us in, in, in the space. And this allowed us then to raise our last round, hitting this magic valuation that a lot of entrepreneurs dream about um, and concluded the first phase of, of, of our, our, our M&A activity. What we realized then is that startups have pretty high expectations when it comes to valuation. And Senda probably also approve of that. But there are also a lot of other companies that are more traditional, that are too small for private equity, too big for the neighbor to take over when the owner wants to retire, that have no digital process, but have access to capacity, especially when we're going to expand it to new jobs. And this is what we started doing now is to see, okay, can we acquire small traditional, also asset light, but without own trucks, companies, bring in our technology, bring in our network and make sure that they grow much faster um, and become even more profitable um, uh, with the technology that, that, we come, uh, that we bring in. And this is now the second phase that we're currently exploring. And I'm actually quite bullish for, for the next year because it's going to help us accelerate expansions into new countries where otherwise it would take two, three years to build the relationship, the network to then um, execute our digital How do you go by uh, determining whether or not a company is uh, worth acquiring? I mean, obviously, uh, a competitor sounds like something uh, makes it makes sense on paper. But then, like, are there any other things? Do you look at culture? Do you look at all these other things? Or are they just secondary to the bigger picture and just things you make fix make make work if you have to? Yeah, it's a very good question. For us, every acquisition was very much around the team the team is a core part that keep everything together. The other companies where it's more of a kind of winner takes all market, where they just want to acquire competitors to get significant market share, turn the unit economic profitable, they do not even always integrate them. It's just, you know, taking out so market share, unit economic proof. For us, that's not the case. Not an interesting number. The five largest players in road trade in Europe, and I'm going to be Schenk and so on, have a combined market share of 5.6%. Combined, highly fragmented market. So for us, acquiring to take, to grab a significant market share doesn't make sense. So we acquire the companies for the know how that they bring in. And know how, especially for more traditional trade brokers, is with the people. And um, so the team is exactly what we are looking for. So when we look at what are the criteria, it's definitely the financial ones are profitable, they have to be you know, developing a, a sustainable and safe business. But what is even more important is how do we make sure that the, the founders typically that sell a company are motivated and engaged to continue working with Sender and give, so to say, what they have created, the baby, you know, the chance to do the next step into the bigger, more orange uh, family and environment. And that's why we spend a lot of time on understanding who are the leaders, how to incentivize them, how to bring them closer, how to make sure what they're getting into. Um, and then once we sign, there's a very uh, strong effort from our side on the integration side. We have the onboarding academy where all the employees of the companies that we acquire are invited to run up permitting to Berlin to get to know us, uh, to meet us. There's a one-week program where to get to know our systems, our leadership, our history, and um, with class that we do. Uh, so it's really about the people and making sure that they stay, that they are a good fit and that they stay motivated after, after the acquisition. Exactly. Um, maybe lastly, just would be interesting to hear a bit more on your future plans. Um, What, which countries are you operating in now? You mentioned you are in, in um, you have uh, six, seven offices and um, you are you're in your Series D, you said you're going to expand in, in Europe. So how's, yeah. that, how's that going? So we are now um, almost a thousand people. I added 650 people over the past 14, 15 months. Opened a couple of offices. Now we have nine offices in continental Europe. Uh, we're looking at Northern Europe, uh, Scandinavian countries, as well as the UK, Finland's as well as some, nice. more Eastern, uh, some more Eastern European countries. Um, uh, so this is what we're going to be doing um, over the next couple of one or two years, either through an acquisition that can accelerate um, our entry or through building it on our own. And uh, that will take longer, but definitely our plan 
to stay in Europe, but to grow into the countries that we're not. Yeah, and you also said that you want to be physically, you know, present in the markets you operate in. So because all markets are different culturally and and also with regulation. So how does that look in practice? Do you apply uh, apply small teams that go in and kind of uh, take care of everything and and try to to open in the market, or do you how do you approach that that um, scaling? Yeah, so it's a good question. As mentioned earlier, logistic is still very relationship driven. So to get someone to work with you, either a shipper or a trucking company, a carrier, you need to build a personal relationship. And you have to generate a certain level of trust to convince them to adopt your technology, to do an API integration that costs some money, or to move away from WhatsApp and use our app to communicate uh, with us. And this is why we think, and I think until now it proved to be a correct assumption, need to be on the ground. People need to meet us, touch us. Um, now, last Christmas, I didn't receive it, but the Christmas before that, I still got homemade sausages from one of our Polish carriers because this is the type of relationship they want to build in the first place. So then you need to be there. You need to meet them. It, it's fine once a year, twice per year, but they need to know you are real, you're there, and then you can build a trust to push back adoption. And this is why having this local present with different languages, with different cultures, with different regulations, as you correctly pointed out, is extremely important. Right, because I mean, the country music thing that I said earlier is kind of a joke, but it's still a bit old school, isn't it? Like the the there's a, there's that mentality is there. Super, super old school, yeah. and people are also afraid um, to adopt technology. Our first assumption was, okay, let's develop an app, a driver app for the truck drivers. And then we have you know, full visibility on what's going on, what has been loaded and so on. We realize that truck drivers not always have a smartphone. If they have a smartphone, it's their private smartphone. They don't want to use it for their boss. They're mostly employed in, in, in Europe. So we said, okay, let's send them a smartphone with a SIM card and an app installed. Um, cost us 50 euros if they drive regularly for us, we cover that. But also then realize these guys, don't like to do that for the 20 past 20, 30 years, they didn't, and they can get another job anytime. So also you don't want to put much pressure on one of the company to make them use the phone. And then if you convince them, they do sometimes some stops where the one will get tracked. So they take out the battery and the SIM card and then good luck putting everything better back together. And um, so also there we had to learn um, that it's relationship driven to get them use you and or and now we on, on that front are now tracking mostly through an integration directly with the telematic system that is installed in our big truck so we get rid of that but it just shows how let's say relationship driven this business is you always have to convince them get the buy-in and this is where personal relationship um made the crucial problem. Makes makes total sense and and sounds very exciting. Yeah. Uh, so we will hope for for future European dominance uh, as well. And uh, it's been very nice to talk to you. Glad you can join uh, the podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you and thank you, viewers and listeners. See you in the next one. Take care. Bye bye. Stay safe. Bye bye.